Hi, I'm Jim Baccarosa, and welcome to Aviation Tech Talks. In this podcast series, we'll be speaking with industry experts and pioneers, delving deep into the latest developments and advancements in aviation tech. From futuristic aircraft designs to cutting-edge digital solutions, we'll be exploring how technology is shaping the future of the industry. So buckle up and join us for an exciting ride as we take off into the fascinating world of aviation tech. Welcome, everyone, to Aviation Tech Talks, where innovation takes flight. I'm your host, Jim Baccarosa, and with me today is Mr. Rob Tuck. Rob, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Jim. Great to be here. I can't wait for our discussion today. We've known each other a little over four years probably now, and I think every time I sit down with you, I learn something new. So I'm hoping we can share uh, some of those experiences and where you see the the world of innovation taking us here into the future. So for some of our viewers and our listeners, I want to start out with giving you guys a little background on Rob and uh, where his career has taken it. So Rob Tuck is the visionary founder and president of Jet Research. It's an aviation consulting firm based in Peachtree City, Georgia. His aviation journey began during his time with the U.S. Army. He holds an A&P license, which he earned in 1989. So over his 34-year aviation career, Rob has demonstrated versatility and expertise. He transitioned from a skilled mechanic to leadership roles, including director and designated airworthiness representative, or many of us know as ADAR. Notably, he served as the manager of outside airframe services for a 121 charter airline, where he oversaw maintenance for a fleet of 12 Boeing 727s. He excelled in planning, budgeting, and program management for maintenance operations, including critical sea checks. Rob's tenure at Aerotest and Hawaiian Airlines saw him pioneer production control systems tailored to each organization's unique needs, and led maintenance planning initiatives. As president of Jet Research, Rob manages a team of independent consultants where he fosters a culture of collaboration to consistently deliver results and innovative solutions. In his role, he specializes in pre- and post-purchase inspections, records reviews, repossession strategies, where all the great stories lie, and maintenance bridging for transport category aircraft. His contract negotiation and interpretation skills are widely recognized, and his precise labor hour estimates for aircraft induction and letter checks showcase his analytical acumen. Rob's innovation shines through in his development of the proprietary software program MFL, which revolutionizes aircraft maintenance and audit cycle tracking, streamlining operations, enhancing efficiency, and ensuring compliance with rigorous aviation standards. Rob Tuck's aviation journey is marked by dedication, innovation, and a commitment to excellence. Did I miss anything there? Did I miss one thing yet? No, but you dated me by putting in 727s there. I don't think anybody even operates those anymore anywhere in the world. Well, they do fly here in Chicago, but that's in a museum. So I was going to say that's frightening if they're still operating somewhere. Yeah, no, they're they're down at the Science and Industry Museum on the south side. They have a, a full replica that United Airlines was donated to the museum, and it's hanging over a replica scale of the city. It's amazing. So for any of you who come to Chicago, definitely go check that out. So absolutely, uh, it's really great. So. So Rob, thanks again for being on uh, today. Our topic is innovations to implement. And we chose that topic today because I think there's a ton of talk out there about different innovations and AI and all these kind of technologies, but yet the aviation industry has been very averse uh, in, in my experience to adopting some of these things. And so 
you know, I thought what we could do is start out with for our, our viewers and listeners today and really keep things that we can implement and where you see taking your past and putting it into the future, what, what we can do. So could you give me an overview of the kind of current state? And let's talk about document digitization, because that's something both you and I hold uh, as a pain or a bane in our existence, I guess. But I'd love to hear your your thoughts on the current state of document digitization in the aviation industry. Well, I think the aviation industry as a whole is always slow to adopt new technologies. I think it's kind of a double-edged sword in that when you think of how things are, you know, at one point in time, think Wright Brothers, it was the cutting edge of technology. But as things progressed, the uh, safety factors began to overtake the innovation factors, uh, rightly so. Uh, I think that there are a lot of people who would be more concerned about making sure the airplane flies than whether a piece of paper has the proper digitization. That being said, I think that aviation is being dragged kicking and screaming into the, uh, the 19th century because it's become apparent that House, warehousing hundreds of boxes of records over the life of an aircraft uh, becomes overly burdensome, expensive. The paperwork itself, and in some cases, the, the disappearing ink act where things just completely aren't, aren't legible anymore, has become a real problem, especially when you're trying to move an airplane on a lease transaction or a sale or you want to operate that airplane in a different jurisdiction. There's a lot of problems that come along with the with the the favored paper, the way that the FAA has sort of traditionally done things. So I think now we spend an awful lot of time trying to convince people that that storing this paperwork uh, in a digital format, predominantly in PDF files, was far superior to housing those boxes and dealing with that sort of pile of paperwork, if you will. And so. I think that's come along to the point where most places accept this. There are still some jurisdictional holdouts in the world that want to see original copies of data, which a lot of times um, it's very difficult to tell what the original is versus a copy, but some of these places insist on it. So the digitization has allowed us to do warehouse things that we couldn't do before because now you're warehousing it on a server as opposed to buying a warehouse to actually physically stick this stuff in. And number two, you're able to go and scan through data, mounds of data much more uh, quickly and efficiently than what we used to call dumpster diving or trash trash box dra- diving, where you're at physically digging through boxes of paper, trying to find one piece of paper among the 10,000 copies you have in front of you. So I think Overall, we're moving in the right direction, slowly, but we are we are embracing what digitization brings to the table. Yeah, and you mentioned a couple of things there. What would you say would be some specific compliance or regulatory considerations, right? And and for this part of our discussion, it's really moving from paper to digital. Are there certain things that you need to take into account when doing that? Well, there, there's a, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, first you have to break it down into what is the paper for, right? The paper is to record an action conducted on the airplane. Generally speaking, that's done by a mechanic or a technician of some sort. So you want to re- retain the integrity of the, the data that's being recorded. So my name's Joe and I'm working on an airplane and I've got a piece of paper that tells me to go do something to the aircraft. And as I go through the process of doing that, I fill out this piece of paper that tells me what I'm supposed to do. And I sign it or I stamp it or I sign and stamp, depending on the process that the airline has in place. And that then moves back to the folks that process that paperwork after I've done my job on the airplane. So you want to you want to ensure the integrity of the what was done to the airplane remains and that you eliminate a potential forgery or or loss of information or you know what was what is the stamp number that this guy uses if he's not using his signature and does that tie back to him and of course there's ways to do that but that's first and foremost is retaining the integrity of the actions taken on the airplane 
And I think through time, the regulatory agencies were always concerned with the thought of, well, how can you prove that this copy that you've made is John Brown signed it? How can you prove that? Because it's not a piece of paper that they could physically see and, and touch. And I think over time, we've begun to accept that there's very little advantage to to potentially forging a piece of paper like that or uh, changing the way it looks once it gets into the computer system. Um, there's very little advantage to that. And quite honestly, the vo volume of paper that's generated on an airplane in a year, trying to go through and, and manipulate that data in any way would be troublesome at, at the minimum. So that's the data integrity we have to worry about from the point of origin. And then you have to worry about the data integrity from the point that it's stored and used. And those are the things that I think that the whole aviation industry concerns themselves with to get off the ground. And I think mostly we've overcome those concerns so far. And you talk about advancements, you know. So where have you seen an evolution where technology maybe in recent years um, has made the, a significant impact to that process. And do you see any innovations there that, that you're excited about? You know, I'm going to date myself again, but I can remember doing <laughs> maintenance planning and things with Cardex systems. Uh, you know, it was, it was the ultimate in misery uh, trying to deal with these Cardex systems. And then, of course, you know, we went to mainframe computer systems. You remember the old IBM ASA 400 systems where there was these big dot matrix printers that printed out all this great stuff. But you could see a real leap in technology in that real short period of time where we went from handwritten Cardex 3x5 index cards to a computer system that you put all this information in and you could recall data uh, very rapidly. And it's migrated even further now where we've got entire data systems that control maintenance and crew scheduling and inventory and AOG parts and that sort of thing. So we've really made some real leaps and strides in the in the time I've been in the business with the airline industry as a whole. And I think now that we've sort of embraced the fact that the computers are back upable and you're not losing data and the, integ and the integrity remains, and now that's making it easier for me, as say I'm a, in the planning department, I can schedule some work on the airplane, I can check the tool crib to make sure the tool is available in, in the system. I can check the parts inventory to make sure that we have the part in-house. I can check to see if it's at a certain station so that if the airplanes fly into Portland, Oregon, I know that those things are either positioned there or I can get them positioned there. Whereas that used to take a lot of coordination in the old days. And now it's sort of at the push of a button. And I think going forward now, we're finding that that ability goes even further with the ability to look through these records in rapid fashion to understand the condition and the configuration of the airplane. So it's not only going from going to do maintenance, to perform maintenance, and to schedule maintenance, but now we can look backwards in that data and understand the configuration of the airplane. Because as these airplanes move about the world, there are a lot of things that have to be done or undone to these aircraft to make them viable for various jurisdictions or operators sometimes. That's great. So, I mean, we've really kind of walked people through, hey, we used to fill out three by five cards. Now we jump to mainframes. Now we're jumping to MR, complete MRO systems within airlines and maintenance organizations, right? Um, and as we look forward, what roles, and we hear a lot about this in the industry, you know, in your opinion, kind of what roles do you think some of these emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, advancing digitization on kind of this historical records of that aircraft, what kind of roles do you think those technologies will play going forward? I think they probably end up playing a dual role. You know, there's a lot of information that gets captured in those records that, you do modifications to an airplane, a good one is dealing with the um, the electric load on the airplane. You know, you've got bus loads that you have to deal with, and there's engineers that sit and calculate all this stuff. And wouldn't it be great if AI, you could plug in the mod you want to do, plug in your ELA, and the thing tells you, yep, you can do it, and here's your load factor coming out of it. 
you know, so those are the, the sort of mod modification uh, things that I think would be beneficial in the future. In addition, wouldn't it be great if I could hand that same ELA over to the next operator and he could look at it and check to see, okay, I'm going to undo this mod, this mod, this mod, but I'm going to add these five mods. And how does that affect the ELA when it comes over here onto uh, into my fleet? And that's just one example of the modifications. Structures, same thing. You're doing structures. You you can do a lot of calculations. There's a lot of things that get done in the structures world that you have to go to the OEM and make sure that are they're going through the SRM or you're going through an 8110 process or an 8100 process to get a non-SRM repair. And all of those things have to be looked at at various times. So all of this data being compiled and available and kept in a, in a position where it's readily available and you can use it on the fly becomes very advantageous as you move through. What would you say then are some of the gaps? Um, you know, I go to a lot of conferences and talk to a lot of these ERP or MRO software providers. In fact, you and I had a discussion about ADSB compliance and your input to me was, oh, Jim, nobody does this. I thought, well, that seems like it should already be done. And in fact, when I speak to some of the MRO software solutions for they say, oh yeah, we do that. I said, how? Well, you have to key it all in. I'm like, well, wait a minute, right? If you didn't right. know, and then you configure your plane and you have to, I said, well, wait a minute. So where are the gaps of taking all of that, especially when we're talking about mods or even in this scenario, you know, compliance with our ADs or SBs, where's the gap between that and where our current systems are today? Well, I think a lot of, we're still manually doing much of this stuff, um, because I think, again, slow to slow to change, right? So we, we have to look at this. And, and not only that, but proof of concept has to be there for a lot of these airlines. Because again, underlying all of this is the safety factor and the liability factor. If you get it wrong, then there's some ramifications that nobody wants to deal with, right? So you have to get it right. You have to find a way to get it right. So there's a lot of proving that we do. We do a lot of test flights on airplanes before we release them. You know, Boeing's starting to learn some lessons there that they knew a long time ago, but uh, I digress. So I think the gaps still are in the fact that probably a majority of this type of study is done manually. There's an engineer who sits there and looks at this stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. I have a great deal of respect for these engineers. I mean, it's a lot of information to take in. It's a lot of information to put, to put back out. And it's a, it's a tremendous responsibility they have to make sure that this system or change or modification they're going to do to the airplane is or maintains the integrity of the airplane. It complies with the type certificate of the aircraft. Or if it's an STC, that it complies with that STC to, and it integrates with the aircraft properly in the proper places. So I think, you know, we're, we're still looking at how that all sort of ties together through an AI process. And I think AI is, is fairly young in its capabilities. Uh, I think there are still a lot of things to be learned. Um, you know, we learn stuff every day as, as humans. And I think the computers might have ability to maybe learn that stuff more rapidly than we have evolved. But nevertheless, there's evolvement to be done. So I think that gap exists because there are, number one, it's a very young process. And number two, we have to get through the proving grounds, if you will, on how this is going to work and make sure that it doesn't do something adverse that we didn't uh, anticipate, you know, the law of unintended consequences. Yeah. Believe me, I live that world every day. So. <laughs> um, yeah. No, no. Um, but, but there has to be, you know, lots of operational improvements or you know, reducing yes. human factors is a big issue, right? So where do you see potential cost savings, right? Because the entire industry is constantly under a, you know, cost saving, where can we find savings to keep the industry growing? Where do you see some potentials there when we embrace some of these software innovative solutions? 
Well, I think, you know, let's talk about aviation records departments. I think airlines are a little bit guilty of not putting much emphasis on the training that they give the people that end up in the records departments. I've seen them take flight attendants who are off duty and sort of shove them in the records department because we don't have anything else for you to do. So light duty means you go sit in the records department and, and shuffle papers. Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of, we'll call them sins uh, of the airline industry doing that. And, that. and that sort of tells you that the airline doesn't take the records keeping department in that particular case. They don't keep, they don't take that very seriously. If they're taking people who have no technical background whatsoever and sticking them in the records department. And I see them hiring people off the street who with no aviation background or no aviation technical background. So they put them in these records departments. Maybe they were data entry clerks before, or perhaps they were uh, typists or you know, something of that nature. So they can type very fast, but they don't process the information that they're being asked to type into this computer system. And so you're asking an individual to fill out a form, if you will. And so imagine if you could take that element out of the equation, because a lot of errors are made from the point of the data coming into the records department and getting into the computer system. There's a human factor there that has to be dealt with. And as I said, I don't know that the airline industry as a whole has done a very good job of making sure that the people who are handling those records understand those records. And so if the computer system, for instance, if that data went right back into the computer system and it were to be filed properly and attached properly to the places and things that it were supposed to be attached to, the, the fact, the human factor would be far less impactful when it comes time to say, lease return an airplane. You wouldn't be digging for a piece of paper that you lost because it didn't get input properly. I have a story where once we were taking back an aircraft and the uh, people that were doing that data entry entered the landing gear uh, overhaul as the day that they received the airplanes. So, Airplane comes to them, they're putting in all the data they need to to fill up their computer system, and they key in the wrong date for the overhaul, which then impacts the next overhaul date. I come along to take the airplane back and discover that the landing gear overhaul was due two years prior to my arrival. So they've been flying around with this airplane with the landing gear overdue the overhaul. So not only did they jeopardize safety, but now the airline is faced with, okay, now I'm trying to do a lease return. And in the middle of that, I have to swap a set of gear out or get these overhauled and put back on the airplane. So now rent continues on the airplane for the months that it's going to take that gear to get swapped out. You know, as well as I do, landing gear aren't usually laying on a shelf somewhere for somebody to grab and put up underneath an airplane. I but know down- somebody has some though. Don't worry. I know. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's that. But <laughs> it, you get the the gist of the problem that this created in a very short and it, all it was was a typographical error putting data entry in. That's right. And so so the costs, you know, in in that scenario really was purely human factor. 100%. Uh, you know, and I've seen that uh, all the time in my world, right? I see that all the time and you know, even if in that scenario, it was probably training and I'm not understanding, you know, the complexities of the aircraft and, and some of the material, but just fat fingering the wrong information uh, happens to the best of us. Sure. I mean, that's it. We're humans. It's almost impossible. Right. So there's and it's not the cost savings, right? And I think your story was great in that it's not the, oh, well, we could save some time on our ingestion. No, it's the, we're going to save potentially millions, right? On catching these influences, right? Before something happens, right? You know, and if you're two years beyond your 10-year overhaul cycle, no landing gear engineer in the world would certify the integrity of the metal and the things on that. They wouldn't. No, uh, and they'd have to self-disclose back to the regulatory yeah, agency. And right. now they're going to get fined for every cycle that airplane flew past its 
past its requirement. Right. Here's another right. one for you that I think that people underestimate the uh, potential here. There are a lot of pieces and parts that make up the airplane. And so um, I was taking an airplane back in Spain once, Mallorca. Uh, good, good old airline down there called Iberworld. Great people, really great stuff. Uh, as I was going through the process, was taken back an A330, and the overhaul on some of the, I'm trying to remember what bottle it was, but it was, I believe it was a, a fire extinguisher bottle. And so the fire extinguisher bottle requires a three-year, I think it's a three-year overhaul or hydrostatic test. In any case, going through the records, I find that one of these bottles is way out of line with with the three-year levitation requirement. And so this particular engineer was a pretty sharp guy. And in the in the service bulletin, in the CMM for that particular fire bottle, it had a shelf life. And then once, the, once it was put on the airplane, the three years began. So a lot of us, when we do what we do, we look at the overhaul date on the 8130 or the Form 1. And we calculate the, the year requirement from the time that that certificate is signed. And then we go ahead and assign that uh, next due from that date on the certificate. Well, in this case, here's this CMM that says that you can preserve this fire bottle on your shelf so it has a shelf life. So it has a shelf life plus three years, right? So if you're an airline and you're overhauling these fire bottles, which you do, and you, you house these things, imagine if you were to able to integrate that information into your part number and it automatically calculates the extra time that it's been sitting on the shelf. Think about the ramifications, the millions of dollars over years that would be saved by having that information integrated into your system and also being able to provide that to somebody like me when I come along to take your airplane. You're not going to have to change that fire bottle, although the lease return says you know everything has to be in a certain parameter. So again, there's data that lives out there in the ether and all these little CMMs and vendor service bulletins and all these little places and crevices that is almost secret information. And if you can gather that data and integrate that into the system, the computer system, and have it automatically apply those factors, millions could be saved by the airlines. Right. You know, that example is great. I, I started my career, first few things I ever sold were fire bottles, believe it or not. <laughs> so, um, you know, being able to differentiate from your 8130 and your shelf life to installation is a great example, right, on what you can do there. And you know, what we've seen a lot of times, though, also is that going to prove that information also is an issue yes. because the systems that either the airline or the lessor or, or, or whoever is using have that data in separate locations. Yeah. They may have the 8130 in some repository or network drive or something, even if, if it's digitized. Let's say that we've, we've finally gotten to the point where we can put stuff in a scanner, right? Versus the MRO system where a human had keyed in that data, right? So now we've introduced human factors. We've lost the the shelf life requirement or potential savings, right? But then also, if you are in the scenario you were just talking about, you're being hired by the lessor to review all the records to ensure not only just the safety, but the lessor really wants to keep the residual value of that aircraft. Right. Uh, of course, you're missing the ability to even prove it. And it becomes this, this arduous process of, oh, I've got to go find that. Or you say, I need it because I can't find it. And we're, we're using, you know, expensive, I'll say labor costs from both the airline and the, the lessor, given that you talk to any CEO, the toughest thing they have now is finding good talent, right? So if I had to look ahead, with with that uh, idea here, um, how do we leverage our existing workforce, right, so that we can help them adapt new technologies? What would you say you could do, you know, because I, I think hiring more talent in the industry is getting tougher and tougher. Um, yes. So so how do we leverage our existing workforce and and let them use new technologies? What would be some of your thoughts on that? 
Well, I think you and I have explored some of that ourselves. You know, I think that we've got an existing talent pool that keeps getting thinner because a lot of guys who have the um, experience are starting to age out, retire. Uh, they're, they're tired of dealing with this stuff in a lot of cases. Uh, because, you know, quite honestly, lease returns in particular can become quite challenging. You know, it, the example I gave you a few minutes ago, you know, that you're right. There was an expensive hourly engineer that had to go dig up this old, I think it was a service information letter or a, or a CMM. Uh, he had to go dig that up because they had it in their practices and it was in their GMM. But now he has to prove it to me because I don't, this is news to me. I've never heard of this before. And so he has to show me this data. So he's got to go dig it up, hand it to me. I have to go read it and make sure that I agree with his assessment of it. So there's a whole process there that takes a couple, three days for the two of us to come to the like mind that he was indeed correct and and off we go and we moved on but now i have to convince the next operator of the same thing so now it takes me two or three days to get this information over to this next operator they take their time in absorbing this information and agreeing with or disagreeing with and sometimes, look, unscrupulous characters are going to go, I, I don't care what that says. I got a contract that says I get three years on the bottle. I want some money as compensation. There's always that game that gets played. But the, the fact is that if this information were sort of universally transferred, there wouldn't be that six-day, 12-day lag time that we're talking about. So leveraging our people that, that we currently have, as you and I have sort of begun to, to look at, how do we get the computer system to do some real basic stuff for us and maybe work towards getting some of this more complex stuff integrated into the way that the computer system can assist the few of us that are left that are doing this and help those that are coming up and don't have all that experience? How do we get them the same kind of informational experience that some of us have just from having lived this stuff? Right. And so... Right. Having the computer system to be able to say, ah, I see this part number by this manufacturer has this sill attached to it, and that says this. And having that information right in front of the people as it moves down the line, that helps tremendously because now we're educating everybody in the in the chain of events here. It's not something that I have to convince anybody of. There's an education process. Having the computer system pick out all the part numbers, and then imagine if it were to go double check the IPC. Imagine if the computer system said, okay, here's all the hard time components on your airplane. Here's the STCs we've done to the aircraft. Here's the IPC. And it could go check all those part numbers against the IPC and say, bang, all of those are eligible to be installed on the airplane. You're good to go. Now we just have to check to make sure that the intervals are correct or whatever. Because you do have some interval changes with uh, maintenance programs that you have to deal with. But the rapid response there because I do spot checks to make sure that this part isn't, you know, look, things happen on the line. A guy pulls an LRU out of an airplane to, to troubleshoot, sticks it in the other airplane, not checking the part number, just it's a 727, that's a 727, I'm dating myself again. Yet she needs to swap the boxes to see if the system reacts to the box change. And, oh, it works. Everybody go flying now. Probably not a logbook entry. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but is that part number eligible to be on that airplane? Is there an STC that affects that system that that part number affects? It might work for the short term, but here I come along. I'm taking your airplane back. I checked that part number on the box. Now you've got to come up with a $100,000 box because it's not eligible to put on that airplane. Sure. So there's right. another dollar figure that says, man, if, if the guy on the line could just punch that part number and said, no dice. You can't put this on the airplane. Right. Because so of are, made these modifications and that and this. Not is eligible. Right. Yep. yep. So there are yep. so many, there are so many time saving factors and so much, I call it tribal knowledge that you can pass along and, and integrate into these computer systems that can be retained and passed through the life of that airplane's records that those five, six, seven day lags become one day, two day lags, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so, you know, I think some of the challenges here we face is getting people to see that into the future, um, especially if you haven't done it as often as you have. Um, right. And, 
you know, the process we're talking about here, especially during a lease return, that's becoming more and more prevalent, right? As the more and more of the world's commercial fleet is being owned by third parties. And given everything we know about the aviation supply chain, and we're not going to talk about Boeing today, but they've been told by the FAA to slow down production, right? Which is even going to put more pressure on the maintenance programs uh, and some of these older aircraft keep them flying. So as we wrap up here, if I had to look ahead, what advancement or, or milestone do you see? We'll talk about digitization of, of this documentation that could happen now or within this year. What do you see are things that could be done now? Not, hey, we're early stage of AI, and you know, but what can we do now? Because we're, we're having the problem now. Well, what do you see? Some ideas. Well, I think one of the things that you and I have talked about implementing is the computer system. I mean, look, Adobe Acrobat can search for things all day long, right? But that's still an individual sitting there having to tell Adobe Acrobat, I want to find X, Y, or Z. And having a system that would go out and, and classify all of these parts as hard times, check the, uh, check the dates to make sure that they're within compliance, and categorize all those in a filing system to where all I had to do was feed them into the system and they drop right in. What a game changer there. Same with heart, uh, with uh, OCCM components. You know, we talk about OCCMs and how there's hundreds, literally hundreds and potentially thousands of these components that get put on airplanes every day. And all of these things are sort of forgotten until the end of the airplane's uh, tenure at XYZ airline. And now all of a sudden they've got to dig them all up. So all of those things being auto classified and moved, you know, when they move from airplane to airplane, those are the kinds of things right up front. You know, I can think of um, engines. And I should probably provide full transparency here. Not the intent of our conversation, but just so everyone knows, Jet Research leverages Provenair in a lot of their engagements. I need to make sure we're, pro you know, completely transparent. Uh, I don't need to get any hate mail from folks going, "You didn't tell us," so I'm. Total transparency. We do work with Provenair. Um, you know, the landing gear stuff, especially with, with some of the engine modules of it. And we've just started talking about doing this stuff. But it was a conversation that you and I had that started that process. It wasn't, right. uh, you didn't come to my office and do a sales job. We've been working through this as a, as a way to do what we do more efficiently. So, and it, and it has helped. Again, you know, Jet Research has been around for nearly 30 years as a whole, and we've done 800 plus airplanes over our tenure, over our business model here. And I can tell you that the, the Provenir stuff that we use has definitely helped in getting past a lot of the complex, you know, you talk about landing gear for a minute, you know, landing gear can go airplane to airplane, operator to operator, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and sometimes multiple hops over the life of that landing gear. And we'll call it the moving goalposts of the commercial side of things where the back to birth trace has to be kept and understood. And I think that's the second highest factor of dealing with this stuff is the understanding of what that is and how it works. But nevertheless, being able to get a system that can provide you with a consistent output and a consistent way of understanding that back to birth trace history and who had it and where it went and how it got there. Uh, having that consistency, again, there's a lot of old guys like me that have been doing this a long time that can do that. But it, you sit me down in front of a set of gear, depending on how many times it's transferred and all of that, that can take me anywhere from three to 15 days to do this. Right. Right. Now, I, I find that your system, the Provenair system, is pretty consistent about how long it takes, or, uh, around five to seven days. And the, the we'll call it error factor is zero. Uh, you know, I don't end up with, oh, I missed that, or I didn't see that piece of paper. It's either there or is it. Right. Yeah. And so the classifications there, and, and you know, I appreciate the the Lord, but you know, for our for our viewers and listeners here, really, we want to talk about innovations and stuff. And Rob, we really enjoyed the conversation having you on today. Um, how can folks reach out to you? How can they find you? We're on the internet, to, just like everybody else is. Jetresearch.arrow. You can find us there. Um, 
You can find us. Uh, we've got a Facebook page. Jet Research is there on a on a Facebook uh, page. If you want to come and take a look at us there, we're on LinkedIn. You can find me in all of those places as well. And thanks great. for having. Me. Really appreciate. Yeah. It. No. Great. Right. Um, so uh, Rob Tuck, president of Jet Research, he's got great stories as well that he didn't share today on our <laughs> podcast. So if you buy him a beer, I think he'll share with you even better ones. So. Thanks again, Rob, for for being on the show. Uh, ha- have a great have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. 